I want to welcome those. I think we have quite a few visitors today. I want to welcome you to Oasis Community Church here. Boy, it's such a nice day today. It's going to reach 70. I've been waiting for this for a couple months. I hope you have too. <laughs> yeah. I love warm weather. Let me um, open with prayer first when we get started here. God, our Heavenly Father, Father, we ask your Holy Spirit now to work with each of us. Open our heart, mind, and soul to the message today. That somehow we can apply to our lives and become closer to you, Father. And be mindful that we should share all good things with others. To share your word with others, Father. So, Father, we ask your Holy Spirit just be present here in a way that we can just feel your presence. And that you're ministering to each of us today in your own way. And we lift this prayer to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I, uh... If you stand, I want to read uh, James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. And it says, Be patient, then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, he count, we count as blessed those who have Preserved, persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord's finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And all of God's people said, "Amen." You may, you may be seated. I. Uh, the sermon today is on patience, and we're going to be ending today with the attributes of God. We've been covering that all week, and so there's many more attributes than we can possibly cover within a month. Uh, the last one today is on patience, okay? And patience and waiting on the Lord, and you'll see it also covers patience in other areas. But to start off with patience, I want to read with you an, illust an illustration that I read about patience, okay? It says this woman had her car stall in heavy traffic. The cars immediately began to back up, and a car horn started blaring. She tried again and again to start her car. It just wouldn't start. The guy in back of her just kept honking his horn out of frustration and a lack of patience. As, he, as his honking continued, she finally got out of her car, walked back to his and said, I'm sorry, but I can't seem to get my car started. If you'll go up there and give it a try for me, I'll stay here and honk your horn for you. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so, patience. You know, patience really seems to be of a scarcity nowadays within our society. We know it is, okay? And the reason why I was thinking about this and was writing the sermon, it seems to be that we, we try to do so much within short, short amount of time that we have. We try to do so much in a day. And if anything or anyone gets in our way, then we become impatient. We just don't have enough time to do things. And see, because of our impatience, or really because of our lack of time, let's say, slowly they involve, evolve fast food restaurants. And when fast food restaurants weren't fast enough, then they added drive throughs to save you a little bit more time, okay? And then, of course, the supermarkets now, if you look in the supermarkets, they have frozen dinners for you, lunch and dinner that you can have dinner ready in 30 minutes or an hour or so to give us more time, okay? And then even breakfast, you know, they have frozen waffles, they have frozen pancakes and pre-cooked sausage so you can have breakfast done in no time. And even old-fashioned oats now can be done in a minute or two. I remember when I was a kid, old-fashioned oats would take 20 to 30 minutes to cook. And now they cook in a couple minutes in the microwave oven. 
And then you look at your banks. To give us more time to alleviate the lines, they came up with ATM machines, okay? And now, if you only have a check to send in, now you can take a picture of your check and you can send it into the bank. All this is to give us more time. Okay? And we look at the supermarkets, self-checkout, fast lanes. And the one that really gets me is rush hour, which is all but a rush hour. <laughs> so they added fast lane for rush hour. All this is to give us more time. You know, there's positive and a negative to that. The positive of that is, yes, indeed, it gives us more time to do those things we want to do. But the negative is, of all these conveniences is when they're not around, see, then we get impatient. Or when they don't do what they're supposed to do. I'll give you an example. Like last week, I was, uh, I heard them advertising it's this Popeye chicken advertising these Cajun wings. And after hearing this day after day, I'm thinking, I gotta try these Cajun wings. So my, my wife and I, we stopped by Popeye chicken. It, it's, it's in the evening. That's my favorite chicken anyways. I get my spicy chicken here. So I stopped by Popeye chicken, order some of their Cajun wings. So I waited two, three minutes, four minutes. I waited five minutes. And I see other people come in and they're ordering regular chicken and they're leaving after a minute or so. And I'm wondering, well, what's going on? So after five minutes, I go up to the lady, patiently, <laughs> and say, how, how, how long is it going to take? Uh, and she hollers to the cook, he said, 10 more minutes. And I'm thinking to myself, 10 more minutes? And I'm thinking, you advertise these wings? Why? Why did you run out? It's dinner time, and you know people are going to be wanting. I'm thinking this to myself, and I'm thinking, all the things that I ordered, why did I have to order these wings? Everybody else ordered regular things, you know. So I'm sitting here trying to be patient, and I'm thinking, I got to be patient because my sermon Sunday is going to be on patience, right? <laughs> so, so, so I'm thinking... I can't tell him I was impatient, so I, I had to be patient. But see, so there's goodness and badness in that. But you know, patience, as we know, it's an it's, it's a attribute of God. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's the fourth fruit of the Spirit, see. And so really, we, and we get this patience from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. But see, patience is, I know, is one area I have to work on. And I keep asking God, God, hurry up, give me patience. For some reason, he's dragging his feet in that area. <laughs> but, but, but patience is a good quality. It's a quality from God. Now, we read James. I want to show you James chapter 5, verse 7. Here's a perfect example of patience. He said, be patient then, brothers and sisters. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop? patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. Now this is a perfect example of patience. The farmer has to patiently wait for the right time to plant his seeds. Because if you plant them too soon and they sprout, then they'll wither because maybe the rains aren't there yet. They'll wither and die. So he has to patiently wait for the right time to plant those seeds. Then he has to patiently wait for the autumn and spring, the rains to come, the water to plant at the right time, okay? And, and hopefully he, he gets the right amount of rain. And then he has to patiently wait for them to grow the time to be harvest. So this is a good example the Holy Spirit has given us here of patience. A farmer must have patience. And implying that we need patience also within our lives. Now, I want you to take note here. Everything that the farmer is patient about is totally out of his control. He has no control on the right time to plant those seeds because it tells you when to plant those seeds if you, if you look at the envelope. He has, no control, he has no control over when those rains are going to come. He has no control on how much rain is going to be. He has no control on when they're going to be ripe for harvest. So you look at almost everything that he's patient about this thing's totally out of his control. 
See, I think there's a message here for us because if you look at your own life, you'll see that almost everything that we are impatient about ourselves, this thing is totally out of our control. There's absolutely nothing that we can do about it in most cases. And you look at those things that we're impatient about, those things that are out of our control, it's just like it is with the farmer. They're under God's control. So really, we must have patience and patiently waiting on the Lord. For a better appreciation of patience, though, we must look at some of the reasons behind our impatience is what we want to do, okay? Because we know if we're impatient towards people, then it becomes a serious problem. More serious than if we're impatient because of a gadget doesn't work right or a cell phone or something like that. But showing our impatience towards others, especially our brothers and sisters, see, can be a very serious matter. So we need to look into the reason why are we impatient with others. So often, it's simply because we become the yardstick to measuring everything. We measure everything towards ourselves. We decide what's proper, what's improper. What's the best way to do this? What's the best way to do that? Okay. What's the fastest way for this? What's the fastest way to that? See, we become the yardstick for others. And when they don't do things the way that we feel they should or how we, we think they should, then we become impatient. See, see our impatience is really showing a lack of appreciation for them. Maybe a lack of appreciation for their accomplishments. And oftentimes that's exactly what it is. Or sometimes we're just not, we're inconsiderate. We're not taking into consideration that maybe they're doing the best they can with the gifts that God gave them. And if God is patient with them, then we should be patient with them also, okay? So sometimes we're not taking that into consideration. They are really doing the best they can with who they are. Now God continues to be patient with us. And so he wants us to be patient with others. And I say he continues to be patient with us because he continues to strain himself with his wrath upon mankind who are blatantly sinning against him. But he is patient with mankind. He is patient with us. Okay? The true test of patience really comes about when things don't go our way. When people aren't doing the things that we want them to do. Or they're not doing the things the way that we want them to do it. See, we come impatient sometimes when we feel that we're treated unjustly. We become impatient if we think our rights are being violated. And so we get impatient this, and we, we feel that now we have the right to, maybe to, to get angry, or we have the right to be impatient. And then this anger that evolves, we, we call it the holy anger. But actually what it is, it's, it's our impatience. To find out the underlining cause of our impatient, it's not those things I mentioned. It's not being inconsiderate. It's not being, not being uh, thoughtful of others, our appreciation of others and the things that they do. Those are only the symptoms, are only the signs that we are impatient. But we really need to find out why are we impatient. And the way to find that out, we must take a closer look at the attribute of patience that the Holy Spirit indwells in us. Paul tells us love is, 1 Corinthians 13:4. He says, love is patient. Of all the words the Holy Spirit could associate to define love, he chose patience. Love is patient. And it's so true. When we show patience towards our brother and sisters, we're showing love towards them. This is why the very first word to describe love is patience. See? And this is why patience, the fruit of the Spirit, dwells in us. God wants us to show patience towards others. He wants us to show love towards others. Paul tells us previous to these, this verse here, 13, 4, verses 13, 1 through 3, he tells us that 
all things should be done out of love. If it's not done out of love, then we're absolutely wasting our time. And this is why he goes on to verse 4 to said, love is patient. And then he goes on to say, kind and so forth. But that's why we need patience. So then if love is patience, then it gives us an indication of why we are impatient with people. See, the times that we are impatient with others is a sign for at least that moment in time See, we're lacking in love for them at that moment in time, okay? Because love is patient. See, when we're impatient with others, it shows that we have now fallen prey to our flesh. See, impatient is a fruit of the flesh. Patience is a fruit of the spirit. So when we are impatient in a grocery store, if we're impatient at fast food place, if we're impatient in traffic, whatever it may be, see, it's a sign that we have fallen prey to our flesh. If we're impatient with our family, impatient with our loved ones, impatient with each other, it shows we have fallen prey to the flesh. Godly patience does not develop overnight. The Holy Spirit worked with us in that area to help us develop that attribute of patience, but it is not done overnight. James gives us, James says in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, My brethren, count it joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now let's look at this here. Now, he said, count it a joy when you fall into various trials. I don't know too many people facing trials and tribulations and they tell me, hey, it's a joy. I'm so glad I'm suffering this. But he tells us, count it a joy. Now, why would, why would James tell us to count it a joy when we fall into trials and tribulations? See, he said, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Okay, but now he's saying that because we're being tested to build our faith. See, our faith is being tested. Being tested by whom? Being tested by God. God tests us, he doesn't tempt us. We're being tested by God. This is why he's saying count it a joy. It is a joy to be tested by God, okay? Because at the end of every test, if you pass that test, there's blessings waiting for you. So he said, knowing that, testing of your faith produces patience but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing okay so it's a joy to be tested by the Lord okay because at the end of, at the end of every test there will be a blessing for you look what James says in James chapter 5 verses 10 through 11 it said brothers and sisters as an example of patience in the face of suffering that the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, as you know, we count as blessed those who have preserved, persevered. You have heard of Job's pers perseverance, and some Bibles will say uh, patience there, okay? Job's patience, and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So right here now, James is telling us that the prophets of old, see, they, all of them suffer, and they, but they persevere under their suffering, okay? under their trials and tribulation. And I know there's many of you here, you're suffering right now, you, you are undergoing trials and tribulations right now. Okay? But you should persevere in your trials and tribulations that you're going through, and I know some of you indeed are going through some. But if we look here in verse 11, it says, as you know, count it blessed is those who persevere. As you heard about Job's perseverance. Now we heard the same Job's patience. And you know the story of Job, but just, just to bring it back to remember. Remember, Satan went to God and said, well, Job is only obedient and faithful to you because uh, you bless him. So God said, okay, do whatever you want to Job, but 
except spare his life, can't touch his life, to prove to Satan that no, Joe worships me out of love. Okay. And so Satan right away took control of Job's life. Job had thousands upon thousands of cattle, thousands upon thousands of sheep. It says he has thousands and thousands of camels. He had seven sons and three daughters. So right away it says, raiders came, sold all his thousands of sheep. Then they stole and, and killed a servant, stole all his cattle, thousands of cattle. Stole all his, his camels. And then he caused a storm, the house collapsed and killed his seven sons, killed his daughters. Job lost every single thing that he had. And yet he continued to praise the Lord. His wife said, curse the Lord and die, but he wouldn't. He continued to praise the Lord. But you know what Job's attitude was? Look at Job said in Job 2, I think it's Job 2.10. He said, shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Think about that. Because some of you right now are suffering. And I have compassion for you. You're going through some hard times. Situations in the home, family, job. Financial, spiritual. But you're being tested by the Lord. You should ask yourself this question. Should we, we accept the deed, the good from the Lord? Shouldn't we accept the bad? You see, we're blessed every day. So many blessings that God blesses us with. We're blessed with Nice apartment, nice job, nice home, nice car. Maybe we just got a raise. We're blessed with a new baby, grandchild. We're blessed in so many ways. We rarely accept the blessings. But as soon as we have adversity, do we accept that? Do we readily accept that? Do we accept it with joy? Or do we start complaining and start blaming God? Job would not do that, see. <coughs> Just keep in mind, if you pass the test, God will bless you. Job passed the test. And because he passed the test, if you read chapter 1 or 2 of Job, he got double the amount of cattle that he had before. Double the amount of sheep. He got double the amount of camels. He got double the amount of everything that he had before. And you could say he got double the amount of children because his seven sons, three daughters who died, they were in heaven, but he got seven more daughters. I'm sorry, seven more sons and three more daughters. So everything he got now doubled. See, if God tests you, persevere the test. Because there's light at the end of the tunnel. Jesus is our light in the world. You keep your eyes on him. You pass that test, there's mighty blessings waiting for you. All through the scriptures, it shows you that. See, you don't give in. I know, you know, it's just so easy for sometimes we, we want to give in, but don't give in. But sometimes you wonder, well, when have we lost our find my place here what are signs that we are impatient with the Lord a sign would be where we're going through trials and tribulation and we cry out to the Lord please help me and we say God I'm turning my trials and tribulation I'm turning my worries my care I'm turning it over to you and then we wait a few days, we wait a few weeks, and we get impatient. So we start thinking, well, start doubting, well, maybe God didn't hear my prayer. Or maybe he's not going to answer my prayer. 
So then we take matters into our own hands. See, this is a sign of impatience with the Lord. See, impatience really with the Lord, not wanting to wait on the Lord, is, is a sign of a, a lack of faith in God, a lack of trust in Him. See. It's a feeling that, oh, I can do better myself, so I take matters in my own control. Sometimes we want to take matters in our own control because we want the outcome to be what we want it to be, and we don't want the outcome to be what God wants it to be because maybe it is something different. So there's so many reasons here that we don't have the trust and faith in the Lord. Paul tells us in, in Hebrews 11.6, Without faith it's, faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, let's look at this a second. It says, impossible to please God, but anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. God is saying, if you come to me, first you must believe in God. You must believe I exist. Don't come to me doubting that it, is there really a God or not. So he's saying, you must believe in me. And then he said, I believe. I will reward you. But he says he rewards who? Those who earnestly seek him. He's saying that's who I I will reward. Well, what does that mean, earnestly seek him? If you look up the definition of earnestly seeking him, it says someone who is really, it's it's done in sincerity. Okay? That's what it means by earnestly seeking. It's done in sincerity. It means that you are determined. Okay? It's showing that you have faith, you have trust in God. And that's what Hebrews is saying here. Okay? Those who earnestly seek him, you come to him totally faith, you believe he exists, you're sincere, you're doing it in sincerity, as then you will be rewarded and then you will be blessed. Okay? And this is what the Hebrew writer is trying to instill in our mind here. Now the psalmist tells us in Psalms 37, 7, it says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. So he's telling us to be patient for the Lord. And to be patient on the Lord means a couple different things here. To be patient on the Lord means committing ourselves to God daily. It means committing ourselves to continue to do good. Committing ourselves to live a godly life, a Christ-like life. That's what it means to be patient in the Lord, patiently waiting on him. But sometimes it's very difficult for us to be patient or to do good when we're under pressures, when we're under trials and tribulation, when we're carrying this heavy burden on our shoulders. Sometimes it gets the best of us and we're tempted to rely on our flesh versus our spirit. So it's very hard sometimes when we have these burdens on us to continue doing what's good. But as James says, continue doing what's good. And it's what Paul showed us. If you continue in this test, and it's only a test, there will be light at the end of the tunnel. And you will be blessed in a mighty way. God wants us to be patient in all things. Okay, He has given us Patience, that's the fruit of the Spirit. What you should be asking yourself is, why is God patient with us? And why does he want us to be patient with others? Have you ever thought about that? Why is God patient with us? Okay. Paul touches upon that in Romans 2, 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. What Paul is saying here, do you show contempt? You know what what contempt means? Just just to refresh your memory, contempt means that that your attitude towards something is that it's worthless or it's useless. And that's what contempt means here. So Paul is saying here, do you consider God's kindness, his forbearance, and his patience, do you consider it worthless? And see, that's what contempt means. 
Some people can see God's patience as worthless because if it tells that God's patience is intended to lead you to repentance. There are some people who are living in sin and they continue to live in sin. And so, and their view is, oh God, your, your patience is, you're wasting your time. It's worthless to me. It has no value to me. Okay? And that's what contempt means. And if we look at the New Living Translation version of it, it says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from sin? God is patient with us because he wants us to repent from sin. God is patient with the six, seven billion people on this earth today. He's holding back his wrath because he doesn't want to see anyone destroyed. He wants to see them repent. This is why he is patient with us. But you know, there's a deeper reason on why he is patient with us. Deeper than repenting. If you go to Second Peter, let's go to the next, uh, the next one, Nathan. Second Peter three fifteen. It says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. God is patient with us because the underlying reason is, yes, that we repent. But we repent that we will then accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and that we'll have eternal life. So the real reason for God's patience, the underlying reason is for God's patience, is for our salvation. This is why he is patient with us. Because he doesn't want to see anyone destroyed. But there are some people who are impatient and they have the attitude as Nathan put up there, Second Peter 3, 9, which said, the Lord is not sh slow in sh keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But there's people who come to church every Sunday, living in their gross sin. They have no desire to repent. They're treating God's patience with contempt, like it's of no value. His forbearance, his sacrifice on a cross, to them, it's of no value to them. Been waiting for God thousands of years. He's not, he's not going to come again. He's going to come again. That's their attitude. God also wants us to be patient with others for the very same reason. He wants us to be patient with others because in our patience with others, it shows our love for them. With our patience with others, it draws them to Christ. Colossians 3, 12 through 13 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Okay. So is patience. God wants us to show our patience and love towards others. Patience means that we're going to live a godly life, a Christ-like life. Okay. 
Patience said we're going to allow for others' faults against us. Patience said that we're going to be readily forgiving of them. Patience restores our relationships or protects our relationships, especially our relationship with the Lord. Patience, as we know, is a fruit of the Spirit, an attribute of God. And I'm going to use this analogy here. As with all fruit, it has an outer layer. Bananas has an outer layer. Oranges, you peel it. It's to protect that fruit inwardly. So all fruit has an outer layer. For protection, also for beauty. For it attracts you. A luscious looking apple or grapes or banana attracts you. You have a desire for it. Well, our patience, which is the fruit of the Spirit, is the same. Our patience protects us. Our, our patience tells people about our soul. Our patience tells people what we're about. Okay? When people see our patience, the love that we're showing them, see, it attracts them to us and attracts others to God. That's our fruit, patience. That's our outer layer. And people can see who we really are, that we are a child of God. There's just one more area of patience I want to briefly mention before we close today. And as James said in James 5, 7, be patient in brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. There are many people who have become impatient over the Lord's coming. Many people, not many, some become Christians because they think maybe the Lord's going to show up soon. And after a few months, a few years, they get impatiently waiting for the Lord. And they go back to the world from which they came. And as 2 Peter 3, 4 says, they will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. And there's people saying that now, see. They become impatient when it comes to waiting on the Lord. But brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you, as the psalmist said in Psalms 40-1, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord. That should be our attitude, that we are going to wait patiently on the Lord, okay? We're not going to be those saying, where is this coming and go back to the world? No. We will wait patiently. And as the psalmist says in 130 verse 5, it says, we will wait, I will wait for the Lord with my whole being. Oh, wait, okay. With all of my hope, let's wait patiently for the Lord. And that day will be here whenever it comes. It won't come too soon, as some of our loved ones won't be part of it. eternity in heaven. And it won't be too late. It'll be at his timing. We are just obligated to patiently and wait. Amen. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father. Father, thank you for the message today. On patience. And how we should be patient with each other. Because being patient with others is showing our love for them, Father. We should be more considerate towards them. Be more appreciative of the things that they do. We should be more considerate that they're doing the best that they can, Father. Father, help us to be patient with you. To have faith and trust in you. That we will patiently wait on you. 
And if we're facing storms, Father, trials and tribulations, Father, we will accept that with joy. We will accept the good from you along with the adversity, Father. Because all the storms coming in our lives, there is always light at the end of the tunnel. And that light is Jesus Christ sitting there waiting for us, Father. Help us and all the tests that you put before us, that we will pass those tests to show you that we love you, we care about you, our hope, our trust, and faith is totally in you, Father. That we cry out to you and ask for you for perseverance, obedience, and faithfulness in all that we do, Father. Father, we're here today out of love for you to worship and praise you to be ministered to. Father, I pray today that our relationship with you is just a little bit stronger than before. That our faith and trust in you is just a little bit stronger than we walk through these doors. That we'll leave here with more hope, stronger faith, more perseverance, and more joy, Father. Father, thank you for your many blessings you bestow upon each and every one of us, each and every day. Thank you for the sacrifice of your only begotten Son on our behalf to pay for our sins. And it's all done out of your love for us, Father. So, Father, we lift this prayer up to you. In Jesus' mighty name, and we ask in that the message today, that we'll meditate on it during the, throughout the week and we'll share it with others, Father, of the great love that you have for us. And we lift this prayer to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.